looks at my activist past and my academic present. And usually I kind of flip past this bit, but given the fact that we've just watched uh, uh, Behind the Mask, I'll be able to concentrate on this a little bit more uh, this time. So I'm, a, I'm an academic now, and I, the reason I usually give this uh, slide is just to show people the range of things that they can talk about in terms of Q&A. So what I'm going to do uh, on this occasion also is keep this rather short so we can have a Q&A session, which is always better than just listening to somebody Myself. Uh, just uh, listen to somebody waff waffle on. But, so, yeah, so I've been a vegan since the 1970s, uh, late 70s there. Uh, I joined initially the Hunt Saboteurs and then got involved in vivisection campaigns. I was on the Sea Shepherd for a little while, and not on the boat, but in terms of being a member in Britain. And I started the, the first animal rights shop. And as it says here, I liked action groups back in those days, and so I formed or co formed. Uh, quite a lot. And in terms of the action that you've seen in the film, and this is covered by this bit, the Northern Animal Liberation League specialise in taking lots of people into animal use places uh, in order to have a look at them. I particularly remember going into a battery unit, and it was called a deep litter unit, where the hens essentially are in cages in mid-air and their feces drop into a big, big pit at, at the bottom. And the value from the social movement point of view of taking people into, into a place like that is that when people see and feel uh, and smell the place and the, the heat and everything, they'll, they never forget it. And so, consequently, it doesn't really matter what a, you know, a, an egg producer says. You know, I've kind of seen the, 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 the real thing. And so it doesn't really matter what they say about free range or what they say about you know, they do this and they do that and it's not so bad and everything else. You know, I've kind of seen it. And then, I was a press officer for the, the Animal Liberation Front, which is the, the group that was featured heavily in the film. Now, to put that into context, in terms of my academic work, I've looked at social movement theory. And uh, social movements tend to go in cycles, you know, there's troughs and there's peaks. And I was part of one of the peaks in the 1980s. In fact, in terms of the main part of the peak, if you like, there was something like, this is just in England, there's something like six ALF activities going on every night. Right? So that was the kind of heyday of the ALF. Now, in that sense, you know, they were just going to dream about that kind of thing uh, now. And so there's an interesting issue about the fact that people are wanting to get back to that stage where the animal, the direct action part of the animal rights movement becomes as much of a threat as we thought it was back in those days. And so the question for the social movement is how do we get from where we are now, which is a bit of a trough, to, a, to another peak? And you know, there are people kind of striving to kind of uh, bring that about. So it, it is a, bit, a big issue, and you saw in the film people saying, you know, we've got to get back to those, those days. And also, if you think about people like Steve Best, he reminds his audiences that we, not, we don't have much time left you know, in terms of the, uh, the environmental crisis, that there's not a great deal of time. The problem for all these people who want this renewed direct action movement is the fact that the general public and society in general are quite passive. In fact, uh, as of next week, I'm going to be doing uh, my part of the module in Social Theory 2 at UCD uh, back in Dublin. And that's looking at the Frankfurt School. And these are neo-Marxists. I always tell my students that social movement, uh, social theorists are products of their time. Now these were German Marxists in the 1920s, 1930s, who, while looking at Marxist theory, were expecting a communist revolution and they got Hitler instead. And so it was a big shock to them. And for the rest of their life, they tried to work out what had happened. What had happened to the revolution. And they were exiled from Germany, and some of them ended up in the United States. And that's where they saw what happened, which essentially was that the working class had been bought off, essentially. And so they were talking about the culture industry, the TV, the movies, uh, all these kind of things. And this has pacified the population. So from the, the animal rights movement point of view, in terms of direct action, 
if you want to radicalize the movement, you've got a problem because the population is pacified. It's a big issue. What I will say, an interesting gender issue in terms of the gun rights movement and also in terms of the direct action part of it, which is the, the fact that there's more women often involved than men, which is unusual within social movements, and also in so-called leadership roles. Now, saying leadership in terms of social movement theory is not uh, a PC thing to do, so they talk about prime movers. So many of the prime movers in the rights movement are women. And so that means that they are kind of leading groups, etc. And that would also be the case with uh, the ALF. Um, it was interesting because this picture here is not the picture I wanted to show you. I was looking for, there was a very iconic picture of an ALF activist coming out of the broad tree in the 1980s. And the activist was carrying a beagle. And I knew that person, I knew she was a woman, right? although you can't, you can't see that. Uh, this is another iconic, uh, this person is male, but I was trying to make the point about this kind of gender uh, divide. The bottom picture, just thrown in there, that was um, when the Hillgrove cat farm was closed down in England, and that was one of the, the last of the very radical kind of ideas, and uh, there was reference to that uh, in, in the film. And in fact, that picture was taken just a few minutes before uh, a police officer broke my uh, my cheekbone in four places <laughs> with, with, a, with a baton, uh, and so I did receive about four thousand pound in compensation uh, for that. The ironic part yeah. of that, <laughs> Pay back time. <laughs> but the ironic part, right, was that I was there. I was in between my MA and my PhD at the time, so I was there actually as an academic, and it was one of the first times when I wasn't there as an activist. You know. And it was also the time when I kind of ended up in, in hospital with my head first open, which is quite ironic. Now, there was quite a lot of shots of rabbits in the film, and I wanted to share an anecdote with you, because it's a really nice one. When I was the press officer, I was the northern press officer of the ALF, and so the Merseyside ALF was quite active. And one time, I met it with some people, they put a mask over me and took me to a place in, in Liverpool which they call a safe house. Didn't know where I was. I found myself in this kind of basement area. And I took, they took the blindfold off and in the boxes that were there were some rabbits that they just liberated uh, overnight. And it was from a farm in Cheshire where they bred for vivisection and fur. So it looked very much like this. And so it was a weird kind of basement thing where you go up some a few st steps and then you were in the backyard which is a walled backyard a completely enclosed backyard so they took the boxes out and, and i went with them and so they got these small baby rabbits and they took them out of the box and they put them on the grass and it was the first time in their entire life that they ever felt grass and they just sat down and stretched their their paws out like this and I still now remember the absolute joy in their eyes, you know. Um, and to think that, you know, their fate would have been that they would remain in, the, in their cages, they would be transported to a vivisection laboratory, or to a, they'd be killed for their fur, and yet now they were luxuriating in the feel of the earth. Just something that we think is so simple and natural and obvious, and yet they, they were completely deprived of that, you know. And I never forget that, you know. I mean, people, people sometimes ask me about my kind of action days and all this kind of stuff, and I do remember those really good things, and I also remember some of the people, some of the best, nicest, most genuine people in the movement I met in the 80s who were taking uh, direct action. So the stereotype, which was mentioned in the, in the, uh, the film, the stereotype of the nutcase and the terrorist is just that, it's a media stereotype, you know, with lots and lots of very nice uh, people in there. Now, I just want to say a few things about a couple of scenes that were in the film itself. Now this one, we saw a couple of, uh, of these scenes in the film, a uh, very kind of grainy um, film, and it ended up being put out by Peter as a, a 
tape in the area. You know, this, this is the actual cassette tape. And uh, it's called an unnecessary fuss, as you can see there. Essentially what happened was the ALF broke into a laboratory and they found 60 hours of film which the viviceptors had shot themselves. Now this is an absolutely amazing piece of footage because it was never meant for the public ever to see it. And so in other words, the viviceptors were being completely genuine. This is what they did, this is how they felt, their values came through. And not only did they kind of take the mickey out of the, the other animals, they were, they were rough, they were you know, taking the piss, they were making jokes, but also they were dropping their scientific instruments onto the floor, and they would pick them up and then they just put them back into the baboons' heads. So, you know, the idea that what they were doing was scientific was just a complete nonsense. When this was all exposed, the people behind the reception industry nevertheless claimed that this was one of the best laboratories in the world. So again, complete exposure of viviception as obviously, from our point of view, massive routine rights violations, but also totally unscientific. I want to end really, before we maybe go to the Q&A, with a controversial bits of the film. There's a, a bit of a lie in the film really, and I wanted to just um, say something about that. In, in the sense that right from the 1980s, it was controversial within the direct capture movement about the use of arson. You know? And so the idea that you can empty a building is a misnomer. You can't. You know? And so this, this puts then the activists in a difficult situation. Ronnie Lee, the co-founder of the, of the ALF, once wrote, I think it was about 1982, for activists to check the roofs for things like um, uh, you, you know, nesting birds, but there's no way you can check an entire building for beings like uh, rats and mice, etc., etc. So the idea that you can clear a building and then burn one down without killing someone is, is a misnomer. And so that puts the activists in a kind of utilitarian phrase, you know, the idea that you, you would do something which had some harm to it, but there would be a greater good to it. You know, that would be ruled out on a rights-based view. So, you know, the idea of burning things down is quite a controversial thing, as, as well as obviously quite a drastic action in terms of... Excuse me, but rats and birds would disappear when they feel any threat whatsoever, well, if they had the opportunity. Well, it's, I don't know, you see, the thing is, if, if, I, if I think about my own car, I know that there's at least two um, spies living in, in the wing rooms, you know, uh, th there would be no way that you could claim that a building is empty. And um, the chance, you know, if, if you were to set a fire inside a building, you know, there's no way you can guarantee that all will get out. And so, it, you then, be, you then yeah, start the, doing the, the... the quantum thing would be more... Yeah, like, that's, yeah, that's right. More it becomes really a balance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Absolutely. So you start to do a utilitarian balancing thing and say, well, you know, I'm doing more good than, than the harm. You know, from a rights-based point of view, that becomes very difficult. That's, that's why it's a controversial thing to do. And I just wanted to point that out in terms of, of that suggestion that by going back over and over again, you can clear a building and then set fire to it. There's a problem with that. That's what I'm saying. Really. I'll do the next one. That's the last one. So, I wanted to keep my bit um, short and maybe see if we can get a bit of a Q&A going. Any, anyone wants to attack me for the... Uh... Can, I just say, can I just tell a little story? In the 80s, like you say, in the 80s, it was big up. 82, 83, 84, 85. I lived in London in squats and we were all kind of animal liberation. And uh, friends of mine went out into an animal liberation uh, laboratory and we whipped loads of uh, rabbits into the back of a, a transit van, legging it off. The farmer sussed us, the lights, give it away, blah, blah, blah. We stopped the van, opened the back of it, threw all the rabbits out, get out, get out, get out, run for your freedom, run. And they hadn't got a clue. Once they got out the back of the wagon, they sat there in a field, sat there, just didn't nibble grass, didn't do anything rabbit-like, and we were just like totally amazed. And what could we do? Like the farmers coming up the hill with shotguns going off and everything, and everything, and we just shut the fucking doors and legged it, and left the rabbits there, and we know for a fact all those rabbits were caught again and put back in. 
cages in which yeah. they, they didn't move, they have lost that. Well, I, I uh, in, in human terms, you say they've been institutionalized, haven't they? Totally, yeah. totally bred. They must have been, we reckon maybe fourth or fifth generation bred in cages and they hadn't, they were so far removed. Yeah. Even though they had the freedom, could smell the air, feel the earth, grass, they didn't even know how to nibble on grass. They yeah. did nothing. They well, sat there blinking in the lights. You know, people, what do we do? Yeah, if people, if people liberate, so uh, we were wondering then afterwards, is it cruel to, what should we do with these bloody things? And once we get them out, they're pets, maybe, but there was like 250 rabbits. You can't give them out to your mates as pets, do you know what I mean? There was a lot of them. Well, I don't know. Maybe 30 out of that lot got rescued. Uh, in, in terms of w when I was involved, th there actually was a, a, a kind of structure in the sense that um, there would be homes already yeah. organised. Yeah, well, we got rid of 30 out of 250. Yeah, we well. We found out the rabbits after all. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point because one of the reasons why, I mean, in, in the 1980s, what happened was there was a change from the rescue bit to what was called economic sabotage, which was the damage bit. You know, and so as he, as he went through in the film, the policies to rescue animals, to do damage, or what we call like economic sabotage, and not to cause any harm, you know, and there was a change. And one of the reasons for the change was because the homes were really running out. And so activists would go to all the trouble of getting into a battery unit, and there'd be 40,000 individuals, yeah. and they had a home for 53. Yes. And then they would have the terrible thing of you know, what do we do? We we pick you know, 53 out of out of this because that's that's the home. It wasn't just a question of you know fill your boots and you know get as many as you, as you could because you couldn't hold them. So it became a big problem, and so people turned also to damage. But also another thing is that, that was later on in 82, 83, 84. We weren't even considering burning arson or anything, although it was suggested. It was never recommended. Absolutely not. Like it was not in the cards. I'm glad that later on that it did come in. That they did actually just destroy the facilities and the rats yeah. couldn't go back. Yeah. I mean, the, th the thing is, from my point of view, as an academic and somebody interested in social movements, there's a problem because the more moderate type of direct action, like the rescue, is popular. And some some of the early press in those days was very positive. You know, freedom fighters, this kind of stuff. It was way before the days of animal terrorist tactics. Yes, yeah. Yes. It was before that. And so you've then got this issue about, well, because our dream and the, the guys in the film, the people in the film have obviously got the same dream, was to make a mass movement of direct actionists, not just a mass movement of the animal rights movement. And we thought we were, we thought we were getting there. We were already doing like six things a night. And we we got to the stage where we thought we were unstoppable, you know. And it turned out not to be the case. But you know, we were we were quite naive, you know. And so we felt that we didn't need to be attached to the rest of the movement. We could just kind of go, oh you wishy washy mainstream people, we don't need you. We'll do it on our own. Right. Now, this is the problem. If you want to be part of the larger movement, which is less militant, then the less militant actions will be better for the press but also better to sell, if you like, to your own movement. The more militant it is, the difficult, because the movement then has got to align itself with militancy. And so they, they go to a journalist and they say, I want to talk about my you know, latest demonstration. And they say, well, what about your relationship with the ANF? And so it all becomes about, you know, why are you supporting them rather than the issue? And so for the mainstream movement, it does become a big problem. You do have a, a real problem there. And it's not just the animal movement, it's across the board. So it's environmental movements, feminist movement have the same thing, you know. As soon as, as soon as you kind of got more radical, then the moderates start to get, you know, kind of dodgy about it. That's, that's, that, that's, that's essentially the problem. Is that? Sorry. Is that why you're kind of more focused on we'll education now? Well, as, yeah. Well, I, I, th I think that the, I think that um, I've always been a supporter of drug action, and I think it's very important. But it's got to have an educational angle to it. That, that's how I feel. Because if we're going to ever move back towards a, a, a mass movement, 
then it needs to, to build in the way that it built before, which was by primarily being about the things that people could get behind. So if, if, it's a, if it's about the more extreme things, then, then you're in kind of trouble, you know. Now there are people who suggest that, you know, by any means necessary. Is so, that one? You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for that. I think there's some things that you should probably rule out. You know, on the grounds that you're trying to build a movement. Yeah, I think there's got to be a mixture. Yeah. So I think I think I think it's interesting thing because if you think about the theorists of, who who are kind of on these two kind of poles, if you like, you've got you know the kind of Gary Francione abolitionist side of things, totally passive, and talking about vegan education only, and then you've got the Steve Best side on the on the on the other thing, which is by any, by any means necessary, and of course famously he says we're at war. Now it's not a conversation; it's a war, mm -hmm. and and. It, He's right. I mean, he was saying that we, as a species, are at war with the environment. Well, that is true. And so, what he wants is 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 a counter war back, you know. And essentially, he wants another army, yeah. And you know, he, he doesn't want an army of educators because he doesn't think that'll work. He wants an army of people who take direct action. Well, well, that's good in my book, but it needs to be a type of low key direct action. Uh, in, in the sense that that's the only way to get the, the mass. You know, we learned in the 1980s that the more militant you get, the more attention you get from essentially the state, and they are powerful enough to shut you down, and that's what they did in, in the 1980s. And like we, as I said, we thought we were unstoppable. We thought there was nothing they could do to us. And yet they arrested a few people, we, we all ended up in jail, and then everything sat down again, you know, and that's the way it was. In, in other words, that movement needed to grow to much bigger than it was before it could really be unstoppable, and we were wrong. You know, we, we just thought we were unstoppable, we weren't. They, they squashed us. So it, it needs, there needs to be a middle way, in, in, in other words. It, you need to have education with support for direct action, and you have to have a type of direct action which is not going to alienate people who will educate. Yeah. So I think you've got to have a, a marriage there. But it does mean that each side has got to compromise. It does mean that the extremes are the, are the problematic areas because both sides of that don't like the extremes. You know? So the, the, mid, the middle area is the easiest bit to do in social movement terms. You know? And again, it's not just the animal movement. If you look at all movements, the feminist movement, you know, if, if you look at the, the mainstream, you know, that the mainstream can tolerate a certain...